You're listening to Arsenal Pass, a flesh and blood podcast for players by players. And all about strategy, leveling up, and the latest news in the world of Wraith. Welcome to Arsenal Pass. So Hayden, I've been uh, thinking about a question, and frankly, I'm just, it's making me self-conscious, but I'm going to go ahead and ask it. Am I uh, invited to your wedding? You make the trip over to New Zealand, definitely. Okay. I mean, you had to I think. thought it was going to be an... I thought it was going to be another Twitter question, but yeah, okay. It sounded like you had to think about that one for a bit. I had to leave you hanging. I had to leave you hanging. <laughs> All right. Welcome back, everybody. This is episode 67 of Arsenal Pass, Brennan Patrick and Hayden Dale. Today, we have a particularly exciting episode because Mr. Michael Hamilton is going to be joining us. We'll run through his accolades later when he hops on here, but we're going to be running down the class constructed meta. Road to Nationals data. The Legend Story Studios posted an article recently, which uh, I had some flack uh, come at me on, kind of, on Twitter about the eth- the ethical sort of uh, the the efficacy of it. Yeah, efficacy. <laughs> yeah, efficacy of them posting these articles and basically potentially, you know, making the meta game less di- yeah, making the meta game less less diverse. Because I think that there's some clear winners, right? There's some clear performers, there's some clear winners, and it does paint a great picture. Uh, myself as a competitive player, I, this article is amazing. <laughs> this is this is such a good pulse to go off of if you're looking to uh, compete in an event anytime soon. Yeah, I agree. I think it's great for deck builders as well. To be honest, it looks it points you towards places to to start to look and to maybe exploit what you're seeing in the meta. So. Yeah, I mean, we're going to dive into all the data that we have available to us. We've got Michael coming on, super exciting, going to talk about his experiences so far with this class constructed meta, his thoughts as well, and uh, get a different perspective than, you know, just mine and Brendan's. I'm sure you all get sick of that. So that's coming in the main topic of the pod. But first, Brendan, how was your week in Flesh and Blood? My week in Flesh and Blood was actually eventful. I, w- I went up to Edmond, Oklahoma to play a road to nationals. Um, it's it's kind of a funny meme going on with me and the, uh, the Covenant boys because... I basically, I've said I was going to go a few times. I've actually bought a ticket to the Team Covenant uh, event, whether it be ProQuest or Skirmish, I think twice now or three times, and I've had to give it away <laughs> last minute because something came up where I was just like, I'm not doing that drive. Uh, but I made it up there. We went up the night before, had a great dinner in Oklahoma, had an awesome event, got to see Mr. Stephen Woolley, uh, just a long-lost friend of mine. I mean, me and that guy... There's something special when we when we get in the room, and um, I just always have a fantastic time. The event itself was great. I drafted; uh, it was draft. My first pod was five people, so I think we had um, we had three pods divisible by eight, and then a fifth pod, and I got in or got into that last pod with five people, which was really interesting. Um, I'm gonna quickly break that down because a lot of things started going through my head at that point. I was like, oh, okay, five person pod. Um, I f- I open some pretty good draw my cards initially and i'm like well if if it's a five person pod the sort of the statistical likelihood of my opponents having poppers is actually going to be higher in this pod um so it's like maybe draw my is not the pick and i actually stayed away from draw my for that reason and i saw a couple good icelander cards and i was like okay i can get into icelander pretty early i know a lot of these people are gonna definitely go go into five because they'll see a higher density of five cards than they're like good quality five cards five cards than they're used to so i went to icelander um, and it was going great. Our table opened zero Spellfire Cloaks, <laughs> luckily, because there's one other Icelander. But at the same time, we get to pack two and pack three. I- I'm not even kidding. I'm ripping open these packs, you know, or, you know, someone's passing me their pack for pick two. And I cannot believe the wizard card quality. It is garbage fire. It is just oh. straight yellows. Yeah. I'm like, what the f-? Like, yeah. it was so bad. Um, and the, I mean, the other Icelander had the same thing happen to him. I, it was just, I, it was a learning experience for me because I was very comfortable post pack one in Icelander. I thought I was in the right seat, everything. I just really needed my freaking cloak. And then I'm opening these packs. I'm like, wow, there's every single card is just freaking unusable. Um, anyway, fast forwarding through the day, did get to play some Wolf Pack members, played Ian Schaefer uh, and Tim Bunn, you know. So Arsenal Pass is a mm, clean 2 0 on the boys. A woo! Took him out, but unfortunately I bubbled out at 11, so I didn't get to win the tournament and snatch it out of Zach Bunn's hands once again. Zach Bunn didn't actually win. He lost in the quarters finals um, to a kid. I think his name is Devin. 
I could be wrong. I really think that's it. He's 11 years old. He won the entire road to nationals. <laughs> Absolute savage. Wow. I think he I did mean. six drafts or something, and he had like three losses, uh, and he forced Fi every time. He's forced to Fi and just wrecks people. Uh, um, but yeah, we had a good evening as well. Drove back, and uh, eventful weekend in Flesh and Blood. I had a great time. It was cool to be able to draft draft the format, and you know my record is clean, Hayden. You can't talk. You can't uh, say anything bad about me anymore after the Pro Tour. Did 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 you top eight? It's not about the top eight. It's a, I, I just I heard I, Zach top eighted. That's no, all. I just heard Zach no, top eighted. No, no. That's, that's I, all. I held a. I I I got us some respect. You know, Team APG. Right. We're, we're doing okay. Too well. All right, all right. What about Sunday? Did you play Sunday event? I did not. I woke up on Sunday and I was like, "Hey, can I go to this event?" I was like, "Oh, I can't play nationals, so nah." And I decided to chill out on Sunday. I had a little lazy Sunday. Fair enough. I have to have a question for you though. How you have to explain this one to me because I'm a little bit lost. How does a, a five person pod versus an eight person pod have the average player with a higher density of poppers? So I could be wrong, right? But this was just what initially went through my head is like, okay, let's say that eight pa- like all these packs or all the packs, let's say you open eight poppers total, mm-hmm. which is kind of a lot. Like more people are likely to have more than one i guess i figured i felt like you know baseline people would usually have one but i'm more likely to run into a deck that has uh you know three or even two or something like that and i was actually looking at going down a line of uh centipies it was actually my second deck of the day was sort of mono centipi um so it's not that you literally open more it's just that your opponents have a higher likelihood of having a critical maximum of them which can really shut down a deck like that so it could be a little bit bro sciencey and be wrong but that took me out of <laughs> took me out of Jeremiah. I can't, I can't see how they can be correct because the same numbers open at the table. I guess you play the a higher percentage of the players at the table because you still play three rounds. So well, the idea, like, yeah, the idea is that experience you're dodging mm. or hitting them, I guess potentially. So I think the idea is that uh, like one isn't gonna be game losing. If I get popped once, I can win. Sure. But if someone pops me two or three times, like I'm just not gonna win that game, right? So it's like I could have a possible auto loss because people will see the poppers more and they have a higher chance of picking them right there could be there's basically i think there's a higher likelihood that one deck has statistically more than they should right but oh and you play against that i think it, it does sound a little bit as you like to call it bro sciencey but uh because there's the exact same amount of poppers at the table like in terms of uh, ratio to players as you would have an eight player versus a five player but you're going to play more of the players so yeah. I, can, I can see how you went down the the path on that one interesting and my my, my final question for you uh, Brendan is, uh, did you have fun? Um, yes, but to be honest, it was because of the people. Like I just had a, those people up in Oklahoma, the people come up, came up from Texas. They're just awesome. Um, I really like hanging out with Zach, Steve and Ian, um, and all those guys. It's a really great time. And I just always enjoy myself when I go up there. So the tournament, you know, it was it was whatever. I, I I went X2 and I bubbled out and it's like, uh, but oh, I had a great time. I had a fantastic time. Cool. Cool. Well, I mean, I had a, a pretty eventful week, mostly weekend, uh, not too much flesh and blood during the week Did a draft on Wednesday, which was good. I think I talked about that on the pod last week and then a little bit of testing started some class constructed testing. Finally, it's been very limited focus for, for me, you know, trying to get my head around this limited format. But as we head into this road to national season towards Utrecht uh, coming up, Finally got some, you know, I guess a little bit of data to work with, some deck lists to start testing into and, and working out what a gauntlet might look like. But the other thing I got to do on Sunday, Brendan, is I hang out with the Tall Timmy. Uh, you know, the infamous Tall Timmy, if you're not familiar with uh, Paul, his, his YouTube channel, The Tall Timmy, uh, does some great content, very enjoyable. You know, he's our best mate. He's given us multiple phone calls. Uh, and we actually filmed a video, which is a Blitz gameplay. And uh, Tall Timmy, Paul himself, is going to be doing the gauntlet for fabtcg.com for the skirmish season five so he invited me to come play a game of of uh of blitz with him for the skirmish gauntlet we played a game we we, video, we actually played three or four games uh there might have been some video corruption issues and we had some fun it was it was a great time and then we did a draft afterwards with uh some some locals some friends including john fluke and box who uh whose house we're recording at and yeah just a great sunday flesh and blood sunday hanging out doing some videos and and playing some some games Keep freaking breaking the fourth wall by calling him Paul. It just ruins my immersion. Ah, sorry. Yeah, yeah. No, it's, it's hard. <laughs> it's absolutely. Because I feel like if I'm in person, if I if I call him, if I'm walking down the street and I say, "Wait, Timmy," <laughs> it just sounds weird. I'm the opposite. So, I just wouldn't disrespect him by calling him Paul. He's Timmy. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. He's just yeah, just such a nice guy. Nice, one of the nicest guys around. So, yeah, good weekend overall. All right. Well, take us into the news, Hayden. Yeah, I mean, on that note, with of course. 
fabtissue.com and the skirmish season five gauntlet coming up skirmish season five is starting next weekend so this weekend of course we do have utrecht coming up and the last weekend of road to nationals and then we get into the skirmish season which rolls into basically the pro tour so uh it's all blitz and some sealed plus top eight draft i believe for uprising so you can go and check those out fabtcg.com to find an event near you find out where your stores are hosting them what days and times uh i don't are you gonna play a skirmish are you gonna play any skirmish i was thinking about that highly unlikely unless it's like uh if reaper does one and i go there to support the store i'll play one but other yep. than that i don't think so yeah i would like to play a bit, a bit more blitz i think this blitz format looks super interesting uh the top eight battle hardened in toronto that was blitz had eight different heroes in the top eight that, that seems super cool to me um i think it's just a timing thing heading towards the pro tour but i'll try and get to at least one, I think, preferably Blitz. I might try and avoid the CL1, to be honest. Um, Brendan, what about Fab Fitness Challenge? Have you got an update for us? We're towards the end of the month now. We're less than two weeks away from the end of July. Yep, week three. Um, it's just been amazing. Like, there's so much, still so much engagement. You can see on Twitter with the hashtag Fab Fitness Challenge um, on there. That's where you're going to be able to access all the posts. Our personal Discord or the Arsenal Pass Discord has a incredibly awesome channel um devoted just to this with a lot of people posting every day supporting each other giving tips and tricks and even tomorrow we have another one of our group calls which we've been doing kind of uh i guess not really every week but this is going to be our second one and we'll close yeah we'll close one out at the end of the month as well and they're awesome you know a bunch of people hop on and we just talk about sort of our month and yeah literally anything that comes that comes to mind i remember we were talking about uh making fun of david goggins last time we were on there but it's a great time um and it's it's awesome getting to know everybody a little bit more. So Fab Fitness Challenge, really, it's headed in the right direction. We're crushing it. Um, I know personally for me, I would say, I think today was sort of the day where I can probably check off like all of the goals, except for the ones that were, uh, you know, do this for the entire month or something like that. I've accomplished them all. So I got there a little ahead of schedule, but yeah, it's been a great time. Yeah, I mean, for, uh, I've definitely enjoyed it. It's been great to see the community and interaction. I know uh, Flake with the Instant Speed Discord has a channel as well. The Attack Action Boys, Taylor and Isaac, also have one on theirs. There's, and there's multiple other uh, content creators and community members that have sort of set up these these ways to interact and, and join as a community, as a group, and of course on Twitter. So it's awesome to see. I mean, um, for me, it's, you know, one of my big goals was uh, improve sort of my sleep. I've been getting on average more sleep, not quite to hit my goals that I wanted. Uh, but but getting a lot better with it, which has been good, and just just enjoying the the month from a, a consistency perspective, uh, which has has been great. So, yeah, overall, really enjoying it and and loving to see what the community is doing, and we've had some amazing stories come out of it. So, yeah, we do want to give a uh, while we're talking about the community, want to give a massive shout out to our, our patrons. Uh, and in terms of Patreon content that we've got coming up at the moment, we do have a deck tech that actually at this point will be live that Brendan did with Tarek Patel, and there's also a deck guide that accompanies that up on the Patreon. Uh, we did a Viscerai deck tech last week as well, where you can find the uh, the deck guide for that as well. Uh, plus, we do have, of course, this month's pod that will be coming out very shortly. Uh, and I think, you know, uh, probably it for this month, but more content coming in August. So massive shout out to all of our patrons. Thank you. Um, and we did also do a, a bit of a, a playmat giveaway last week. I asked for, we did hot takes, of course, last week, me and Brendan's hot takes. And I asked for, you know, the best hot take in the comments or one that I enjoyed for this playmat that was provided to us by Dice Jar Games, an amazing store down in New Zealand. Plus, we got some heralds to chuck in as well. So, um, shout out to our winner, Andrew Osman. Andrew said his hot take is Brendan will win on camera during the next event he's at. And then, more reasonable hot take, Viscerai will show up in Dynasty somehow, but first he will win the Pro Tour. So, uh, Andrew, if you can get in touch with us, either send us an email to arsenalpassfab at gmail.com, flick us a Twitter DM or something, and uh, we'll get that out to you. Hey, Andrew, watch me uh, watch me bring Vissar out of the Pro Tour and check both those bad boys off. Oh, calling a shot. Let's see it. All right. But before we head into the Command Cookout, I do want to mention that that deck tech with Tarek Patel is a five deck tech. <laughs> um, so, yeah, if you're interested in that, Sorry, hero, yeah. Yeah, it's, I know. <laughs> Just like, was kind of, yeah. So, if you're interested in that hero, uh, you know, he's an absolute sort of master, um, kind of the architect of the OG. It's funny to call OG at this time, Cheerios Briar deck, but now on Fi, and he gives us some spicy details. But, Hayden, let's go ahead and head into that Command Cookout. What do you have for us? Yeah, I got a great question that came from our YouTube comments last week, actually, from Lucas Ward. Uh, a bit of a follow-on from our Commander Cookout last week, actually. So, you know, a bit of a sequel sort of business going on here. Lucas says, uh, kia ora, guys. Thanks for the pod. Kia ora, Lucas. Uh, Commander Cookout question. In the last pod, Hayden mentioned that raw talent is a key factor to competitive success in this game. I was wondering, to you guys, what does talent look like? What fundamental understandings do you think top-tier players have 
that the average hardcore pleb like me doesn't have. Lucas, I would just, you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say pleb. Uh, is this stuff like having an excellent memory for pitch stacking or being able to see the path a game is taking several turns in advance? And how do you think that players with a strong understanding of the game can develop the talent that exceptional players seem to have or seem to show instinctually? Thanks again, guys. Love the content. Yeah, I thought great question just following off from last week because we did mention a few things about, I guess, um, uh, you know, taking the game seriously and, and le leveling up to that more competitive level uh, with a question we did have last week. So I think the first thing I want to say just on what Lucas is saying here, I think there's... A lot of these are kind of, it's really hard to pinpoint. Some of these are intangibles, but, you know, I think we're going to try and do a bit of a job on what this talent could look like. We did talk about some other, I guess, more tangible fundamentals that people can work on last week. I think a memory, the first thing I want to say, a memory for pitch stacking isn't isn't the be on end all, to be honest. Um, it, it's a, it's It can help, but it's not super vital and it's not all that's important because we've talked about pitch stacking before. You can go and listen to the pods we've had, but just this ability to probably at least be aware of the pitch stack is kind of what, I guess if you talk about quote unquote, I guess naturally talented players, they probably just have this awareness of what's happening in the in the pitch stack. They kind of generally know where cards are. They might not necessarily be focused on the pitch pitch tracking, uh, but on the flip side, you can also have players who work on that and then you know really nail down or hone in on pitch tracking and um, get to a certain level. So it can really depend and vary, I think. And then the other thing before I pass it over to to my colleague Brendan here, um, I think <clears throat> just being naturally strategic is probably the biggest advantage that a lot of I guess top players who just have these inherent talents have, which is, you know, they're able to see the big picture and generally they start there before going into details. Um, you know, if you watch someone like a, you know, I don't need to name names, but if you watch, you know, the top players that you see as or perceive as top players play, you'll notice that they are playing a, a full game like uh, Lucas alludes to with this. And it really is just being strategic. It's just trying to take a step back all the time and use that kind of treetop view, that helicopter view, and understand what's happening in the game before you get too bogged down and, and caught in the details on a turn by turn basis. Any, anyway, any thoughts from you, Brendan? It's interesting because um, I'm actually less of a believer in talent um, and its effect on player success. And even, I would say to an extent, its existence, right? And like, uh, if that's really a thing. There is, there is one, one that stands out to me though, which is evaluating cards <laughs> and evaluating and understanding value. And that's not talent. That's just some people whether it's through their nurture or maybe it's their nature, have have a mind that can just do this, right? They just they either do it for their work or they've been doing it their whole life and they just get it a lot faster, right? Um, we're speaking to one of those people today. For me, that person is really Michael Hamilton. Like I talk to Michael Hamilton and everything is just so much more simple. And it's the way he evaluates the game is very quantitative and very fundamental. Um, I think that that is a massive advantage but at the same time, you can come from the opposite side of the spectrum, which is kind of where I came from. I didn't come from card games. I didn't even come from like a very technical background. So I think that flesh and blood has actually influenced like me as a person and my life by somewhat, some, in some way teaching me how to think, right? Because I think that this is just like a valuable skill is being able to break, thing down, break things down to their most simple and minute parts and understand like just the individual essence of value for whatever you're applying that to. And sort of create your hierarchy of either decisions or of cards based off that. Um, that's something for me that I felt like I've had to learn. And I've been impressed how fast some people will come onto the scene and just immediately get it. Yeah, I think you say like not really believe or intel and et cetera, which, which I get. But I, I think for me, it's more that there's two streams. And you've kind of, you literally just talked about that. You know, you identified someone who maybe came to the game. I think Michael top eighted the calling after playing for, you know, a few weeks, his first calling top eight and then one a calling you know a few months after starting playing and then another calling you know this is the year after playing so i think you can see that some people come to the the game with and it may not be just pure talent right it could be just experience with other card games that you can trans trans transport over um but i think some of these things you just talked about like the ability to evaluate cards even if you haven't really played tcgs before that's like an inherent understanding of like just picking things up quickly. And I think that kind of does, it depends how you define talent, right? But I think if we're talking about some of these natural skills that people can't explain, uh, they can't say exactly how they got to them or how they do it, I, I would call that talent in some way. So I think there is, like you say, there's like a there's like learned behaviors and then there's these ones that maybe they are slightly learned, but they're so deeply ingrained in a lot of these people that um, kind of what I was saying last week, some of them don't even, they're not even aware that they're doing it or that they have these skills and talents, I think. 
um, which is super interesting. I completely agree. Like, I think card evaluation is one of the most important. And I think, you, like you say, you can learn that, but you can also have it naturally. I think you can be faster at it naturally. Uh, you can learn to be better at it. Um, it's like, it's this thing about being observant, I think. Like, again, from the strategic standpoint and not getting caught up in the details, this is the, the very similar sort of thing. Is like you pick up on small things that happen during the game or you pick up on things that are happening. Maybe you're talking metagame, maybe it's draft. You know, you're not memorizing every single card in the pack but you're memorizing key packs, cards in the pack for the wheel, for instance, in draft, like small things like that. And it's, some of them become so ingrained and some, you know, you might have to like do this multiple times, but for some people it just comes, you know, naturally they're just you know, but like, okay, I've done three or four drafts. I just seem to realize that, you know, these cards coming back to me are really important. And then they start to think about what those cards are uh, and they might not actually be consciously doing that every draft, but it's just happening for instance. So um, I do think as well, like, I guess that's maybe like fast learning. Like some people are just fast learners and that's just, how it happens right and they learn intuitively not necessarily through step-by-step -step guides or um you know rote learning or anything like that so i think that's quite interesting the last one i did want to say as well on this question from lucas is uh i think i'd call it like abstract thinking so you can think in a different way to solve problems i think this gives people a lot of ability to take game states on or take a changing game on um or think about maybe they could be deck builders as well i think a lot of deck builders have this as well where they can think in an abstract way where they take they can subvert what is the known, I guess, and they can walk away from that pretty easily and go, well, just because this is what's being done in these decks doesn't mean I'm going to do that. Uh, just because this is the play that's kind of prevailing in this game state doesn't mean I'm going to do that. They're finding other avenues and other lanes. And I think you can, again, you can train yourself to do that. I think that's quite difficult, but a lot of people can just naturally do it through a deeper understanding of the game, which is, um, or, or just maybe just value in, in games in general. Someone like Michael has a massive experience in, in background in games, which I'm sure he'll, he might tell us a little bit about in the main topic. Yeah, the last one for me is uh, passion. Um, I would say with like a, on the borderline, like on the borderline of obsession. I think that that's like a key ingredient. Not that it's necessary. I just think that it, it's an ingredient that you see a lot in successful players. Uh, yeah, no, completely agree. I think that's a, a good one as well. Passion and, and just a, a want and drive to play the game. Well, thank you for the question, Lucas. Uh, if you do want to get your command and cookout questions like Lucas, you can drop them in the YouTube comments below. You can send them to us at arsenalpassfabgmail.com. If you're a Patreon, you can drop them in our Discord channel for command and cookout questions, or you can DM us or whatever you want to do. Um, yeah, I mean, a, a really tough question there, I think, from Lucas to follow on from last week. A lot of these are intangibles, but I do thank you, Lucas, for the question. I hope we at least shed some light on it. I, I think it's it's a really difficult topic to talk about, and I think, to be honest, I might have to go away and, and think more deeply about it, <clears throat> and maybe we might revisit in the future. Actually, yeah, uh, I just want <clears throat> to quickly end because I did remember my second one, and that is humility. I think always being the student and understanding that you have a lot to learn from other people, even people who think you're crazy, uh, or you might think are crazy with their crazy. ideas and their decks and all that stuff. Usually there's something there. There's a nugget. Um, so yeah, humility is a big one. Love that too. Love that too. All right, Brendan, let's, uh, we're about to bring Michael in for the main topic of the pod as we talk about the state of the class constructed meta with Uprising as we're into this road to national season. All right, on to the main topic and a massive welcome to Michael Hamilton. Michael, welcome to the show. Thank you. It's good to be here. Or the pod, I guess. Mike, in case people don't know Michael, I'll let you introduce yourself. But because I know you're a humble man and you won't do it yourself, Michael, first of all, I'm going to say Michael is a two-time calling winner. I believe in our three-time calling top eight competitor, if you're not familiar with Michael. Uh, also top 32 at the PT, I believe. So, uh, you know, Michael's resume. Although I'm sure he won't shout about it, speaks for itself. And also just genuinely one of the nicest people I know in flesh and blood. So, Michael, thanks for agreeing to, to join us and to talk Classic Constructive with us in a very interesting season that's starting to shape up. Oh, thanks, Hayden. I'm, I'm excited to be here. I want to ask, uh, to, to start with, how are, you, how are you enjoying your flesh and blood at the moment? You know, I, I think a, a poignant question to start with. You know, it's been an interesting year so far. Maybe talk to us a little bit about, I guess, your, your year in flesh and blood and how you're enjoying the game right now. Um, so over the holidays at the start of the year, I wasn't really playing a whole lot until Indy started coming around. I did a bunch of testing for Indy, ended up playing the Bravo star of the show list. Um, after that, I've been playing pretty consistently, just preparing for New Jersey and now preparing for Lille and playing the new limited format, which is very interesting. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah, I, I mean, I'd love to hear your thoughts about limited. We might have to save that for a uh, another pod. But maybe first, just what? Uh, how are you finding this constructed format? Like, are you are you enjoying it? First of all, yeah, I really like this constructed format. I think there are 
a lot of viable decks. The metagame still seems pretty open, even after several weeks of Road to Nationals. And there are a lot of heroes that feel reasonable to play. And like, I wouldn't say you were making a mistake or not making the optimal choice if you told me you were going to play quite a few different heroes. So <laughs> that's a good spot to be in. Well, I'm playing Azalea, uh, so I'm, I'm glad. That's uh, that's but, one of the few that I think is a bad choice. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm yeah. I'm playing Bolton, so you have to worry about me. Michael's okay with that one. Yeah. If um, you talk to Roger, Roger loves Bolton, so I can't talk yeah. crap about Bolton. I actually want to ask about that before we jump in. And so we do have this data from Legend Story Studios. They've published on the Roach National season so far. We have weeks one and two data. We are seeing an uprising meta starting to form. But before that, you know, while we are introducing Michael, I wanted to just give you the opportunity to tell us a little bit about what you're, you talked about playing, but you're also starting to do some content as well. I know you and Roger uh, have started a podcast. Do you want to tell us a little bit about that as well before we just jump into the sort of the data at hand? Yeah. So me and Roger started the MNR podcast. It's pronounced Manor podcast. Uh, we've been doing it for about two months now. It's been going pretty well. We are focused mostly on the competitive side of the game, talking about tournament choices and different parts of the metagame and basically optimizing your chances of doing well and just basically trying to help people that are wanting to level up their game. So similar to your guys' podcast. Yeah, we'd, we'd love to see it. We love... Uh... It's not, you know, some might say competition. We don't see it, Michael. We see it as uh, as, a, as a harmonious partnership, right? Like just more competitive content out there, I think, is is good for players. And um, both you and Roger have a, have a wealth of knowledge when it comes to, you know, competitive play. So it's um, it's good. If you haven't already checked it out, go. I think you're, you're on YouTube. But are you also on, uh, I guess, podcast platforms as well? Yeah, we started on YouTube. And just a couple of weeks ago, we got on all the major podcasting platforms. I think there all the major ones. If we missed any, let us know. <laughs> But yeah, you should be able to find us. Are you on Pandora? Is always the big question, you know, uh, that everyone's asking. So, oh, oh, okay. I don't even know if it exists anymore. Anyway, <laughs> uh, Brendan, I have a question for you as well because I know you talked about this at the top of the show. So we're going to dive, dive into this data. But first of all, what do you think about, uh, I guess, uh, you know, a bit more of a philosophical question? Alice is publishing this data for. Uh, for these road to nationals, giving us the kind of class constructed data from all the events so far uh, that have happened around the world. So my personal opinion is I love it because uh, the just aggregating all this data, this data is a lot of work. Um, we had a few community members in the past that would do it do it for us for the and give it out publicly. Shout out tower number nine. Tower number nine. Yep. Um, and I always really appreciated that, and it's very helpful for our testing process, um, especially when I kind of because I think a part of finding the quote unquote best deck in flesh and blood sometimes is. You need to know what other people are playing. Uh, so these these kinds of articles are very helpful and they just they develop that baseline and that pulse of the meta. There has been some feedback that potentially legendary studios shouldn't be posting articles like this because, and I think specifically when you look at the article that was posted most recently, there is some clear indication of what hero you might want to be playing. Um, and that article in and of itself might... Uh, might cause a sort of convergence to a less diverse meta and a less interesting meta. That being said, mm. I think that the positives outweigh the benefit for me. But if we were going to take that philosophical to its most extreme and look at a game like, you know, maybe Magic the Gathering or particularly Hearthstone, where they really utilize big data and things can get solved quite quickly, I think that that is something that I would not enjoy. But this is a, this is a far cry from that. So... I'm overall I'm pleased. I actually thought the article, by the way, I thought the article was actually written really well and there was a lot of detail and I was yeah. pretty impressed. Yeah, we're going to get into this article, but I think it's written by um, Mal Zenith, who people might know, I uh, believe is they've one judge and quite well known through like the Discord community for Flesh and Blood as well. So uh, yeah, I thought it was really well presented. Michael, any thoughts from you on just, I guess, this data being shared with the community? Not To be honest, not something I had thought about until Brendan brought it up earlier uh, that people, you know, maybe see this as not necessarily a benefit and, and do see some negatives to it. Yeah, I hadn't really given it a lot of thought. I know in back in my days from playing Magic, they posted a lot of data. There were a bunch of online smaller tournaments that happened all the time, and they'd share a lot of data from that. And people kind of pointed to that sharing of data from the online events as why the formats kind of got more... Maybe, I don't know if solved is the right word, but people like would converge on what was perceived yeah. as the best deck and they gave that data sharing a lot of 
uh, blame for that, I guess. And I'm not sure if that's exactly the truth or if that's exact, like the only cause of it. I think people generally gravitate to the decks that are good regardless of what they know. And I think that having this data, like saying that Alevia won, Ak- Akatsu won, Akano won, uh, won these different road to nationals, it gives people like hope to try different things, I feel like. So I don't think it's all negative. Yeah, I agree. It's like validity to some of these heroes, right? Which you might otherwise have not, not have, right? Like, uh, had I not known a Kano one or that, you know, Dash has actually won three events. Uh, but anyway, yeah, interesting views. I think this discourse will continue as we get more data and more events, right? Because our sample sizes are quite small and that's something to, to sort of keep in mind as we head into this data. But let's let's get into it. I'm sure people want to hear the meat of it. So uh, you can check out this full article and breakdown of the data. Uh, we've kind of extrapolated some of this, but it's on fabtcg.com. That's the week one and two sort of Road to Nationals recap. Let's talk about the most played decks at Road to National season to start with. So the the number one most played deck this season so far from the weeks one and two has been Briar. Briar was 14.5% in the meta, followed by Fi at 12.5% in the meta, then Prism at 10%, and then you go down to Viscerite, just under 9%, uh, same around Lexi, around that area. And then you go down to Ultim and Dory, which is about 7%, and Icelander at 5%. And those are your, you know, your top eight heroes, basically, through this Road to National season so far in terms of representation. Brennan, I'm going to start with you. Any surprises there in terms of that representation? No. Um, I don't think so. I would expect more Viscerai. I think that actually if they did a, another article in a couple of weeks, Viscerai would come up in percent quite a bit, especially considering the day that we'll get into, which is sort of this conversion rate in the top eight and conversion to win. Um, I actually want to pass this to Michael. On. I want to ask you the question of, talk to me about this... Um, so-called, right? It's, it's so-called, but this this rock, paper, scissors, right? We have what usually would be the Runeblade decks, but I guess I can group it into the aggro decks being Briar, Fi, and Viscerai, the main ones. Um, and then this sort of dichotomy between Old Him and Prism. Um, how do you see that in this format? Is it is it quite rock, paper, scissors-y? If you're playing Old Him, are you really trying to dodge Prism? Can Prism exist and function well in a heavy Runeblade, heavy aggro world? Yeah, so that I think the aggro decks, the two rune blades and Phi, are kind of like if you're playing Oldheim, that's probably what you're trying to target, and you're probably trying to avoid the prisms. And prism will definitely beat up Oldheim. I don't think there's really anything Oldheim can do to have a great prism matchup. You can devote a lot of sideboard slots to bring the matchup closer to even, but it's never. I would be surprised if any Oldheim shows up their deck and is like, "Yeah, I beat up prism with this list." Um, and then Prisms historically kind of struggled against the aggro decks. When Briar was the top deck, Prism was not really doing that well. And when she did see success, it was mostly preying on the old times that were preying on the Briars. And the the fight decks look very solid against Prism so far. So I think that Rock, Paper, Scissors metagame is still going to at least somewhat exist, even if the Prisms find ways to fight back against the Agrodex, it's never going to be the matchup they're most hoping to see. Do you have any, yeah. do you feel, do you have any hope? I, I mean, hope is not, hope is kind of a strong word because I'm just saying, what do you think about these, these other decks are sprinkled in, uh, particularly the disruptive decks, Lexi and Icelander, and maybe even Jermai. Do you think one of them has the potential to sort of come into its own and maybe become the best deck in the format? That's a tricky one. I have always thought Lexi was, pretty good and reasonably underrated looking at how much play she got and kind of her results not being amazing this season but still being up there she had respectable results i think it wouldn't surprise me if lexi ends up being one of the top decks in the format um icelander and dromai are both kind of tricky to figure out the best builds for they're new heroes we don't have a lot of data on them so far and we don't really know exactly what the best list will look like and I think both are very powerful. I think that both heroes bring a lot to the table. Icelander through her disruption. And Dromai, the rate on some of her cards and dragons, if they aren't getting popped, is very, very good. So I think both of them have solid reasons to choose them. But what does I don't the build know. Look like? if, yeah, what does the build look like? And, and I, I could definitely see either of them becoming one of the best decks in the metagame. If they will be the best where everything is centralized around them, I'm not sure. I think they're both kind of targetable. Dromai through Poppers, Icelander through just bringing Arcane Barrier and a higher blue count. 
it's hard for either deck to just be the best deck and no one else or other other decks can't really do anything about it yeah i think as we have more heroes into the game right these these kind of uh interactions dimensions like dichotomies between like these heroes and where they sit is so it just it evolves and evolves right and even within a meta game you can have certain you know sort of degrees of like you just talked about a classic example prism ultim right like what does that matchup look like but then what happens when you start to add in these other decks and you start to factor in what could happen with those i think i wanted to go back to um something a little bit about representation as well just why we're talking about decks played because brendan you said for you like no real surprises but for me like if i thought about when uprising released the kind of decks that would I would have seen is like, okay, what are the decks that people are going to gravitate towards to start with? Well, I think Fire seemed natural because it seemed like this kind of powerful go wide aggro deck, and and that's a really you know it's a, it's probably the easiest of the three heroes to work out first, maybe uh, to to Michael's point earlier. But then Briar, yep, Prism, we know like still strength there hasn't been hit, but Ultim was the other one where I felt like you know when I look at these results, I'm surprised mm-hmm. on my early thoughts from week one of. Of Alton being down here at the kind of like equal sixth most played with Dromai and slightly above Icelander but below Lexi. Like that to me is a is a bit of a surprise just given what we know from previous formats and, and where Alton sat. So yeah, I don't know. What it, Michael, any surprises for you in this representation? Like are you surprised by where Alton sat versus say Lexi and Icelander? Yeah, I, I am kind of surprised Oldheim is so low on the I guess representation. I think that Oldheim's kind of more of a control deck than a lot of the other decks and the way you want to build oldheim is very dependent on what else is in the format like if you are looking at playing a bunch of guardian mirrors and having these long matchups where you're just like trying to fatigue the opponent almost you need to have your high earth count and you need to be able to earth react a lot so you don't run out of cards yourself while you're blocking and then if you're trying to shut out the aggro decks both well Fia and briar and viscerai are all aggro decks and they all basically tried to kill you fairly quickly. The tools you need to fight them all changes based on which one you're fighting and also based on the build of them. So it's not necessarily the easiest to build a good Oldheim deck, even though we've seen Oldheim do well in the past. You can't exactly just copy the old deck list and expect it to perform well against new uh, challengers. Yeah, so so I guess maybe that, that kind of conclusion is Ultim, very good, but in an unknown meta, seems to maybe not be as as easy to build, not in the maybe the right position as opposed to just a linear aggro deck or a, uh, maybe something like a, a Prism Aura deck that can be a bit more linear and just have have a plan. Um, whereas when you're trying to answer a question, when you don't even know what the question is at the start of the format, maybe that's a little bit tougher a proposition to, to sort of face. I have, a, yeah. I have a hot take here, I think. I don't think it's a hot... It's not that hot, but looking at... It's like, just looking already. looking initially at these numbers, I think if I read between the lines, there seems to be a narrative here where... I I think that old hymns are not only losing to prisms. It, I think they're also losing to these aggro decks. Um, where do you see old him position? How do you feel about old him right now, Michael? Do you feel like you just are these? Are you extremely favored into the briars and viscerize and even fies? Um, is is that why you're playing old him? Yeah. So. That's why you would want to play Oldheim is a theoretical good matchup into these different aggro decks. From my testing and playing different Oldheim builds, I've lost quite a few games to Briar. I've lost a few games to Fi, and I haven't played Oldheim into Viscerai very much, but I did run into an Oldheim that I think is very skilled at a local RTN while I was playing Hayden's Viscerai deck, <laughs> and I beat him in a close game. So I think that. Figuring, like like I was saying, figuring out the right builds for old time and f- making sure that your cards line up right. You have the right threatening on hit triggers. You have basically the right ratios of defensive cards and offensive cards. And it's just hard to figure out. And if you don't figure out the right answer, you're just gonna you're gonna lose to whatever you're not prepared for. I, I take your um your time at the calling Orlando, right? And your win there, Michael, where you played Ultim and Although that Lightning Briar deck was, you know, it was the deck of the format, right? In terms of people were saying it was still, you know, quite hard to adapt to that. You you did adapt to that, right? You knew about that deck from UK Nationals. You knew it was going to be played quite heavily. And you came with an Ultim deck that could play well into that. Plus also have, you know, game into what you thought the meta was going to be. And, and that was at a point in time, I guess, where, you know, you can look at the meta a little bit and evaluate. And I would say, you know, it, it, you can... Correct me if you think I'm wrong here, but the, that format was kind of narrow, right? Like there was only a few decks that people were looking to play, which was like Bravo... Briar 
and um, you know, some people started to talk about Alton, but then people were saying, "Oh, you know, you go to time; it's two hours to play Alton in a big event." And obviously, you prove people wrong. But uh, do you think that's a case in terms of like you know that that form is just a bit more not solved, but a bit narrower? You knew what to target as opposed to right now, where it's like, well, you know, look at this. Hit my mic. Look at the spread of data. There's there's so many decks that people could and are playing right now. Yeah, for for that tournament, I built my deck to beat Lightning Briar and be as reasonably positioned against the other Guardians as I could. And almost every round of that tournament, I played against Briar or a Guardian. I think I played against Chain twice in the tournament, once in the top eight, and I played against Reinar once. And other than that, it was just Briar and Guardians that whole weekend. So it was definitely a more narrow metagame than what we're looking at here. I want to move on from representation. I think we've kind of talked a bit about what that meta looks like. It's the last thing I do want to say is if you know if you take a Brendan your lead on kind of what's an aggro deck right now, uh, and you look at these first two weeks of of data, um, you know, forty percent of what we've seen so far, or nine or thirty five percent, maybe depending on how you include Lexi and some of these other like dash decks and stuff, around thirty five to forty percent were, were aggro decks through these first two weeks, which is it's quite interesting. I think in terms of it's probably pretty similar to what we've seen in the past. It's not like the, the the shift of if you class these as aggro decks or however you want to try and build archetypes in this game. They've been pretty similar, right? And maybe in past formats, it was less spread. So rather than Briar being 14.5%, maybe it was 30% in some metas. Chain was 30% in some metas. You know, uh, these these aggressive decks we've seen before have been a lot less spread out. But um, the actual kind of overall representation when you break it down by kind of rough archetypes is pretty similar to what we've seen in past formats. Mm-hmm. Any, any just kind of final thoughts on Brendan before we move to kind of some of this top eight representation? I just think that that's like a general concept of card gaming. It's like as you head into a new meta um, or a quote unquote new meta, right? We have three heroes introduced. This is the most new meta we've ever had because we had the rotations with Living Legend. Like aggro is just usually a good choice unless there's an obvious reason not to play it, right? Because anybody who brings anything cute and is trying to have fun is probably going to lose against your deck. Um, you know that you know that Prism is popular. You know, you have a very good matchup. And against Oldham, from what I've heard as, you know, and what we speculated, it sounds like it's a winnable matchup. So I think that, you know, taking, maybe taking a, uh, taking a page out of another game's book, like if I'm going into a new format, I'm looking for the white weenie deck. So that's either five Viscerai or Briar here. Well, the mono red burn, the red deck wins. That's yeah. what you're looking for. Week one, Red Deck wins. That's where mm-hmm. I'm at. I'm all about it. All right. Let's talk about some of the, the top eight meta game. We've talked about representation. And as we start to look at, you know, how a hero is converting, that's where I think it starts to get really interesting. So we talked about most played decks, Briar, Fire, Prism, Viscera, Lexi is the top five. And then let's move into top eight meta game share. So which heroes are sitting in there? Briar, 18.2%. So a bit of a jump up on the representation to top eight. Fire, 12%, converting around the same as what it's showing up in events. Viscera, 12% as well, 11.7%. So a big jump up from Viscera in terms of what's showing up versus what's top eighting prism at number four at 11 percent, and all time and number number five eight percent so you know bumping up from that sort of tied sixth to uh to fifth so lexi falling out of that top five and and ultim um and viscerai bumping up in there as well or viscerai bumping up to third any kind of first thoughts on uh the top eight share versus the representation what do you what do you take away immediately brendan i know you've been itching to talk about this Oh, uh, yeah. I mean, there's just a, a lot more prism than I would expect here. Number four, right? 10.9% conversion. Like, you're looking at, so look, look at this. Literally, I can just say it to you. One, two, three. Briar, five, Viscerai. I feel like that doesn't set up number four to be prism, kind of whatsoever. Because uh, prism does struggle into those decks. Like, it is a hard matchup. And it's hard to, if you're, pl- if you're playing prism, to prey on guardians, which it doesn't even look like there are too many guardians in this format. Uh, that build of prism specifically is quite bad into these more aggressive decks so i'm surprised to see prism's conversion here uh but old him old him as well like i don't i don't know what what my final thoughts are or what what i'm thinking about that the data right now in old him because i think the deck is very powerful i thought pr- before going into this format it was somewhat de facto kind of the defensive like the go-to deck there but we're just not seeing as much as I would expect. I would I, honestly, I would, I would have expected to see old him at like number two, right? Yeah, maybe, maybe just. I think it goes back to the point we just talked about with with Michael and just kind of that ability to attack a meta game and what tools you need versus watch aggro decks, right? This you say one, two, three aggro decks, right? Well, if you're playing an old him and you need different tools for each of those aggro decks, it kind of becomes meta dependent, right? I don't know any any kind of extrapolating thoughts, Michael, on this 
this top eight share. I mean, you see Briar take a massive jump up, Viscero take a massive jump up, Fire and Prism are pretty flat, and Ultims are slightly up as well. Um, I think part of Briar and Viscero both doing pretty well is that their decks haven't actually changed that much over time, and if and what they were bad against, basically Starvo is gone and Chain are gone, and so you can go back to kind of playing your old versions of Briar, your old versions of Viscero. And the decks are still very good and they are tested. So there's less to figure out there. And since they're more aggressive decks, they don't have as much that they need to figure out before they're in a good position. So most people that show up playing a Briar deck or a Viscera deck, they'll have a pretty solid deck, a pretty solid set of 80 cards with reasonable plans into most of their matchups. Whereas yeah. with the new heroes that are less represented, you aren't really going to know if your deck is one of the more ideal versions of it because again they're so untested and there's so much to figure out with them i want to give you the both of you the conversion data as well and then just get your kind of thoughts on that because i think the conversion is what really tells the story right because you know the amount of players that show up to event can dictate you know what actually gets into top eight in terms of you know people play mirrors some will get in some won't um decks will do just generally well against certain heroes but when you look at maybe some of these smaller you know it doesn't take into account some of the the heroes that are less played and how they're performing so if we look at the actual conversion to top eight i mean this is kind of the crazy one for me viscerai 48 percent. so 48 percent of viscerais that are showing up to road to nationals are making top eight um obviously you gotta count for size and things like that uh briar's at 44 percent ultim's 39 percent so ultim's actually third percent in terms of conversion so smaller player base but doing well into top eights prism at 38 percent and then dash is actually sneaking up there at 37 percent of, of dash players so you know we see a little bit of a, a shift around there but what we really see is that the this and briar in particular are really converting into their you know they're, they're showing up on the day and they're doing well getting us top eight but also dash uh, any thoughts on that from you two michael maybe any thoughts on dash i know you're a, you're clearly a dash aficionado right just, I, just hiding it i know very little about dash i'll have brandon give his thoughts on that one yeah i would just it's interesting i'd like to see the what well, i need to know dash is like uh how many dash is played right so maybe weight that a bit more and look at the event size because we don't see any we don't see any mention of dash and then it creeps up here in the conversion rate so i'm wondering what the sample size is that being uh, said the, like the ninth most played it's about five percent of, that, of the game show. that's reasonable it's not nothing. that's reasonable yeah, yeah nothing. that then i think this is totally valid um so yeah dash is uh i could see and i did read the article so it is mostly boost dash from what i understand that's a totally legit deck that deck can really surprise you with how much damage it puts out especially with teclo pounders um and i think that it kind of it's on on the same line as five viscera and briar where it's playing a linear aggressive game plan to force the opponent to adapt and the opponent actually might be sideboarding incorrectly in the first place because it's dash yeah so here's a here's a question for you and michael because you talked about you think that all three of these heroes are viable but the data says that Iceland are kind of trash. You know, has one of the worst conversion rates into into top eight. It has pretty reasonable representation. You know, the sort of top ten, top eight most played decks at Road to Nationals. I think eight percent of the or seven percent of the meta. Uh, but you know, a conversion rate into top eight of fifteen percent, one of the lowest conversion rates. Any sort of general thoughts on that? Is is Iceland actually just no good, or is it uh, is it just early doors for Icelander? I would guess that people are still figuring out the builds because. Not getting too much into my testing, but I think we've had some pretty solid results from Icelander, and I think that our builds are still reasonably unrefined, still have a lot of work to do, and she like her core plan feels powerful, and even if you like it might take a while to figure out all of her matchups, and Prism is also all over the place, and I don't really know how to fix that matchup from the Icelander side, but if you can get Icelander to a place where you can beat the Agridex, which I think is doable, then I think she's a pretty solid choice. It's just figuring out your plans for the different Agridex. All right. So not not trash, not unplayable, just bad conversion rate to start with, but you know, you expect to see that come up. You think the core tenants of what Icelander can do is, is powerful. So expect to see yeah. that. I, I, I don't know, Brendan, any kind of closing thoughts on uh, conversion rate? I will say some of the other kind of lower conversion rates where they, there was uh, representation Lexi, 28%, really low as well, conversion rate for Lexi into top eight, which is probably the one that surprised me the most, actually, one we haven't talked about just yet. Um, actually, before I throw to you, Brendan, Michael, any thoughts? Because I know you've played a bit of Lexi. Uh, maybe some thoughts on why Lexi is not converting to top eights, and maybe, especially in an aggressive meta, if people are playing Ice Ticks, I would expect that to be a lot higher. Not really sure why Lexi isn't doing better. I think she's very powerful. I think that the heroes that are currently good all 
kind of struggle into her, except I guess Prism and Old Time. But I think the other three aggro decks should theoretically struggle into a more refined Ice Lexi build. So I'm I'm not sure why her results aren't better than they are. Yeah, I, I think we're going to talk about wind shares in a moment. And uh, Lexi is actually reasonable in, in those results. And I, my kind of big takeaway maybe on Lexi is that uh, not the easiest hero to play. Can suffer from some variance in events, uh, especially if you're, you're unfamiliar with lines of play and how to maybe play through some of that, that variance. Um, but I do think you do prey on the aggro decks. And I think, t- to be honest, and I'll ask you both this question at the end, but if I was to play a Road to Nationals this weekend, I, I would probably pick up Ice Lexi, to be honest. So it's... Um, yeah, it's an interesting spot. Any Brennan last last thoughts on uh, conversion or I guess um, share into top eight? Um, no, I just have a question for Michael. Does the Icelander build uh, in your testing process or group, whatever you want to call it, is it is it winning against Old Him? Uh, yeah, it is. Okay. I can kind of go into theory a little bit on it. I think that as Icelander against Old Heim, you try to set up your endgame combo and similar to how Kano would play against Oldheim where she pitch stacks or where he pitch stacked and set up a really unbeatable combo that would get through whatever Oldheim does basically. Icelander can kind of do a similar thing, but she also gets to set up these permanents. You get to have three Frost Hexes, three Insidious Chills, several Amulets of Ice in play, and then just basically kill Oldheim from a pretty healthy life total at the end of the game. Yeah. So if okay. you if you have a good matchup into old him and a good matchup into the aggressive decks, if you can find that Icelander build, I mean, people have rolled the dice on a hero that is good into aggro decks and potentially good into control decks, but bad into illusionist, and they've seen success. So that puts that puts Icelander on my radar. Um, I think that that is that's a good place to be because we might see the illusionist fade out, right? Um, Prism. As we see Viscerai maybe pick up significantly in representation after this, you know, the data has been released, the deck lists are out, uh, Prism might start to fade. Yeah, I mean, I mean, that's what that's kind of what I see, right? Like, that was the reason for Guardians in the past, right? Like, in terms of taking Guardians to an event, you know, you never, I don't think you ever want to see a Prism, right? But you could have builds that could could obviously perform better, like Michael said before. Uh, but there's always kind of been this prism to me feels like the gatekeeper of this format in so many ways. I know people keep saying it, but it, it kind of is in terms of it, it does regulate the way you think about this format, even if it doesn't regulate your choice in the end, to be honest. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, one other thing that's holding Icelander back that we didn't really talk about is we've also found Dromai to be a very difficult matchup for Icelander, different builds of Dromai. She struggles with the dragons. She can't include too many poppers very naturally in her deck. And We've just found that matchup to be really rough too for Icelander. Mm-hmm. Yeah, makes sense. I mean, probably probably the one deck we haven't talked about so far is Dromai, and and that's because it's not really seeing on either end of the spectrum here. It's kind of just you know it's about seven percent of the metagame share. Uh, it's showing up. It it, it top added some events, and um, you know it even it even won a couple of events. So uh, you know not one we've talked about. I, to be honest, I think for Dromai is that uh, my initial take on Dromai. Not sure what what you both think is that very hard to build. Uh, very hard to play into your bad matchups, I think. So decks that do naturally trade well into your dragons can be very difficult. But I think people are finding ways to to do this, or they're finding the the right matchups. They're maybe finding the slightly right builds and and seeing some some results. So Droma is one I have my eye on. Uh, I don't necessarily think for me it's one of the the strongest sort of things you can be doing in this format, but um, it it seems to be at least performing. Yeah, played it. Um, felt really weak into some of the more aggressive decks, particularly Briar. Uh, <laughs> so. I don't know. I wouldn't. I wouldn't take a deck to a road to nationals or a major event that isn't isn't favored into other into aggro. Right? I'd either want the best aggro deck because I don't. There's not that many old hymns. Uh, I don't know how the mirrors go, but you know that might also be a lower percent because not a lot of people are bringing illusionists. And then you're just gonna find out most of your matchups are potentially unfavorable. That's if my experience with Dramai is accurate, which I found it to have a harder matchup into something like Briar. Yeah, I mean, illusionists are still gonna show up. We know this, so <laughs> sure. let me think about. It. All right, want to talk about winners meter as well. So, twenty uh, percent of Road to Nationals in Weeks 1 and 2 were won by Viscerai decks with 19.3%. So it's 1 in 5 almost. Uh, Briar and Prism were both tied at 14% of wins. And then Fi actually slips down to 4th at 11%. And Lexi actually has the 5th most wins. Uh, so 8 point more, just, just shy of 9% of Road to Nationals being won by Lexi. So, you know, underperforming maybe top 8 conversion, but overperforming its stats a little bit in terms of actually winning events. Uh, and then Dash and Ultim 
and Dromai all tied for six with three wins each at uh, 5.3%. So you can see Dromai is winning. Um, Dash is still hanging around there with that good top eight conversion. And, and Ultims are, you know, I think where Ultims are picking the right tools, like Michael said before, are winning events and, and targeting the metagame and doing well. Maybe ones that know their local meta uh, more than maybe an unknown metagame. Prism is doing well too. It's number two tied with Briar, 14% win, yep. which is yep. way high. Much higher than I would expect, you know, seeing Viscera and Briar right, right above it. So Still uh, very strong. Yeah. yeah. Michael, any thoughts from you just on this kind of one of five being won by Viscera? I think we talked about a little bit. Obviously, Lexi doing some some work down there uh, with, with 5%. But yeah, do you have any thoughts on what Brendan just said about Prism sort of still doing well, not only not only showing up, not only top eighting, but also winning events. Yeah, I also kind of surprised by that. Playing Prism into so especially five, but all three of those aggro decks seems really tough from the Prism side. And her still having these very solid, very I guess consistent across all metrics, it seems like results is definitely interesting. We saw it at the Pro Tour as well, right? In terms of, you know, it was perceived that the Prism matchup into Chain was terrible, right? And Chain was second most played deck. Uh, the matchup into Prism, uh, sorry, into Bravo was seen as, you know, for some sort of favorable, favorable, some thought it was slightly unfavorable, but around, you know, no, I think people by the end thought that it wasn't necessarily a particularly amazing matchup for, for either side or particularly not for Prism. But we still saw it show up. We saw it have quite high conversion today too. We saw a copy get into top eight. So, People are still finding ways to to win these games and to do well with Prism. Do you think that's just pure power of Prism, then, Michael, or is is it is it are people just getting a bit lucky with their gym pairings? No, I, I think I think it is just like the raw power of Prism. She has a very for basically being the only illusionist for so long. She still had a very wide card pool and could implement like it's not really not really just the Herald plan, but like. The flexibility of having these powerful auras that really shut out some heroes and also having a lot of very strong attacks that block for three. It lets Prism be pretty flexible in her game plans and how her games actually play out. And she can kind of um she can kind of adjust what she's doing based on what needs to be done. And her cards, she has a lot of cards that are just very powerful on rate. Yeah. But playing Prism personally, I've never felt I've never gone into a match or played a game where I felt like, oh, this is just awful. Like there's certainly other heroes I've played the game and it just feels miserable. Like, you know, there's not there's not good avenues to win. You have to get very specific lines and you have to get a little bit of like luck from your opponent sort of side as well. Maybe they need to misplay for you to win. With Prism, I always feel like games are winnable. Uh, you know, a, a good sort of like string of herald turns here. I double aura turn one, you know, there's all these sort of things. But Brendan, as a as a hard claimed Prism main for the past year, uh, and of course a big advocate of Prism on the channel. What are your thoughts on, I guess, maybe just, just why the results are there? So I got to rewrite history a little bit. So when we got to the Pro Tour, it I was... Know. Rewrite history a little bit. Take us, take us back to the facts, right? It wasn't that... Like, it wasn't like uh, we thought, like, oh, Prism has, like, an uh, whatever matchup into Runeblade, but it can win, and then that got changed over to, like, oh, it's not so bad. You can play Prism. No. I think we went into the Pro Tour, and I think a lot of people did you know there was there was a contrarian group that you know believe the opposite the prism just like auto lost to a lot of these these ring blade decks like it was pretty bad um that wasn't the case it performed better than we expected that being said you said it had a good good day two conversion i think you're correct i think we brought up that data and i was like particularly surprised about it but i would need to see the numbers because man i just don't believe it the reason why people brought presence of the pro tour is because somebody's got to warm the seats at the bottom tables and it was a lot of prison players down there unfortunately i was hanging out there down the, i was down there was with them say. hanging out you know on my kano um but yeah it's a i think it has a bad room blade matchup i do uh it, it had this kind of asymmetric way of attacking chain via fatigue um which you know was debatably successful but i think that its matchup into briar is terrible like i think that is a bad matchup um and i would love to be proven wrong but i, I think it's really bad I will say in the last meta when I played Prism, so I played Prism, I think, for three Rotana, uh, three Pro Quests. Um, I didn't hate the Viscera matchup personally. I thought that matchup was actually kind of fine. Uh, I thought that was like pretty pretty close I th with the with Scalata still around, that is. Um, so I think now I don't think it's particularly a favorable matchup for Viscera. I, I think I agree with Michael. Like, you know, it, it, you've, 
I think when you sit down across from a Rune Blade, you go, that's going to be a tough match. You know, it's not going to be an easy game. It's there's there's going to be, uh, but there's so many different ways you can attack. You know, you can get auras early. You can also just come in with like with good heralds. Uh, you know, you can just deal pure damage, which is um, yes. is, is a good way to win games. So yeah, I, I think that even against Chain, I felt like. You know, often going first, I felt like I could win those games. So, Scal yeah. Scalata um, was really important to that matchup, to be fair. Like, the so the strategy, and like a lot of Viscerai's actually played that matchup incorrectly, in my opinion. Like, the strategy where you would pop off on Scalata on like turn two or turn three, as soon as you had a reasonable amount of rune chance, have a big spike turn, and then put Prism on a low enough life total where they would have to actually start blocking with cards from hands, which block inefficiently at two or block at zero, is really what made it feel pretty bad for prism because they basically had a few turn clock to develop a significant board and develop a significant advantage before you just put them on the back foot and they're trying to react by blocking with cards from their hand that effectively can't even really do that and then they really can't uh enact their game plan by playing you know auras that cost four resources and stuff like that so i think without scalata potentially right the 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 viscera matchup could be uh, it definitely is significantly better than when scalata was a thing um but is it favorable i don't know i'll need to test it that's why you, that's why I always keep the arc lights in, you know. Just punish that turn to Scalata pop. Anyway, um, no, I, I do I do agree. I think Scalata obviously a massive hit to that deck, but but yeah, uh, I do just want to talk quickly about win conversion as well. So some of these maybe less represented heroes that have done well that are showing up. So Eviscera had the highest twelve percent of players showing up were, were winning their events. That's uh, that's a pretty high amount. We talked about you know twenty percent of the of the wins Kano uh one k one k no win mm -hmm. but 11 percent of of uh win share win conversion sorry prism 7.2 percent then dash and then lexi uh briar actually pretty pretty low on that uh five percent same with bolton katsu ultim um so same with bolton bolton's a zero don't you trick us i uh, uh I, it's, it's low. I said it's low yeah i posted a nice meme about that but bolton zero i think it was like zero top eights and zero wins maybe it was just zero wins but bolton sucks just yeah. want to get that one out there Apparently, uh, and Viscerite also converting twenty four percent of the top eights into a win. Prism at twenty percent, Lexi twenty percent. So, you know, my kind of like uh, I'll pass over to both of you to give you kind of like closing thoughts on representation, top eight, and then win conversions, and kind of what we're seeing from the starter. But I'm gonna kind of give my thoughts to start with. Is that my big kind of takeaway is obviously Viscerite really performing the data. Uh, Viscerite's done really well in this format. I think you know I think a lot of that's early kind of just a deck that can play has a really good proactive plan but also doesn't just get trounced on by these kind of hate decks i think um we see as well like prism still continue to work we just talked about that at nauseam i think it's clear that prism still has the power and then lexi actually when you look at it is while maybe not you know doing as well as top eights is still winning events and actually doing well overall big for the big part of that for me is that i think lexi is, is hard to play it takes experience i think people are picking up these ice lexi decks to try and prey on aggro decks and maybe not quite understanding their role in the matchup uh maybe you know not quite finding the right patterns of play and, and ending up losing to some of these aggro decks that maybe they they wouldn't think they'd lose to or with a bit more reps wouldn't find that they lose to and i think we're seeing players who understand these lexi decks who have picked them up and maybe tested them or play with them for a while still doing really well and i think lexi is a really good pick so did want to close on that with saying that you know if i was playing a road to nationals this weekend i think i would probably probably be taking ice lexi having played some some games with it and feeling um like it's a pretty good meta choice into viscerai and briars but michael i'm gonna i'm gonna throw to you for i guess like closing thoughts on just kind of what we're seeing out of out of this data just wrapping up the data from your side what you think what are you extrapolating from it yeah i think viscerai doing so well is pretty surprising but i think the format still seems pretty open to me and again i, I think there's a lot of heroes that are reasonable choices and if you said you were picking one of probably like 10 different heroes for your road to nationals i'd be like that seems like a very solid choice so if you have a good list you're happy with and learn your matchups i think that's where like any anything could be the right choice not anything not azalea sorry Most, azalea. <laughs> a number of things could be the right choice yeah yeah a number of things could be the right choice while, while we're talking about that, Michael, what about Fi and Briar? You know, they haven't really overperformed the stats necessarily, but they are a big share of the meta. Combined, 27%, you know, so a quarter of the meta game at the moment. If you rock up to an event, you can pretty reasonably expect to be Fi and Briar, uh, but aren't necessarily, you know, putting up the wins to match that. What are your kind of overall thoughts on that? Like, are these just good, solid aggro decks, or is there more to them, or are we actually going to see them start to drop off? I, I think they're both good, solid aggro decks. I don't think they'll drop off too much they might drop off a little bit as people learn these trickier to figure out decks and they kind of i think five briar and viscerai all have a target on their head right now since after doing so well then people are going to be 
practicing into these decks and they'll come to their road to nationals or upcoming major events prepared to fight these decks. So it wouldn't surprise me if they fall off a little bit, but the power of the decks means I think they'll still see significant amounts of play. And especially when they're, there's not really currently the data doesn't show any reasons to step away from them. If they're who are you currently working on now? Yeah. Yeah. Winning one, one and five events on this, right? Brendan, what about you? What are you extrapolating from the starter from your side? So I'm actually going to pass this question because I know we're on a tight schedule and there's something particularly interesting that I want to dig into. At the beginning of this podcast, Michael, you said we were talking about Oldham. You said Oldham this, Oldham that. I'm probably going to play Oldham for the Pro Tour. Talk to me. I I said maybe. (laughs) I know, but talk to me about why that is. What do you see in Oldham that other people aren't seeing? What kind of results are you getting that other people aren't getting? So I personally have a soft spot for Oldham and... I will forever because he was my first big success in this game was winning with old hype. And with how popular the three decks are, Briar, Fi, and Viscerai, I think that I feel really confident that I can find an old time build that is favored into all three of them. And that's why right now I am leaning in that direction, even though there's a reasonable chance I don't end up on it, but I think he's definitely a solid consideration and I've put the most time into testing him so far this format. Yeah. I mean, you also, you, you uh, can say that you say that Brendan, in terms of like the results don't say it, but, but Ultim has been performing reasonably well. Like it's, it's performing at a level or above what Briar and Fire are doing in terms of, you know, conversions and, and wind shares and stuff, but it's a lot less represented. So I, I think, although, you know, you say that I think Ultim is not, it's not, uh, my surprise is not showing up in quite the numbers that I would expect, but it's not doing poorly. I'm just trying to get into the mind of the master. You also said, uh, Michael, and I quote, you said, you're surprised that Viscerai is doing so well. What does Viscerai struggle against? The yeah, age-old question. I'll, I'll start and say Lexi. I, I think Viscerai's worst matchup is, is Lexi. And, uh, it's yeah, but there's not. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there are, there are bad matchups, right? But, like, it's a less represented deck. Like, what in the current meta is this, is a bad... Like, in the popular... Like, in the vast majority of the games you'll see, based on the data that we have... Why is it why why not play Viscerai? What does Viscerai struggle against? I guess an easy answer is a race face has been very good against Viscerai. And as decks find ways to include that card, I think Viscerai is going to struggle more as he can't really, if he keeps a four or five card hand in the face and against an erase face, he's going to lose a lot of the power from his turn. So if a lot of decks look to slot that in, then I think that's kind of spells bad news for Viscerai and he also like coming into the format it wasn't the most obvious choice for me like Briar seemed like the go-to Runeblade if you're looking to play a Runeblade and then Phi also seemed very like a very solid aggro deck right out of the gates it was very easy to not very easy but there were a lot of successful Phi builds that were coming out very quickly as people were just exploring the hero it felt very powerful so I was surprised Viscerai was doing this well, mostly because he wasn't really a hero that I kind of had rated that highly. I think as well, Brennan, right? Like the kind of my thought is just hearing Michael talk there as well is that the the point Michael said before about, you know, these these Briars, these Viscerai decks, like a lot of the, the shells we're seeing, uh, what we saw six, seven months ago, right? Or maybe post Galata ban. Um, and to start with those kind of heroes, you know, I think you know the target on the back kind of thing is if you're looking if you're thinking reasons to not play those heroes well you know maybe you're you're looking at a deck to to target those to be honest that's probably what you're looking at i could see that i could see that yeah um it's interesting heading into heading into the pro tour here you know these these old him decks uh, what do you if you could give if you could give the people listening one big tip on old him it can be a card. It can be a card plus advice. What is it, right? Do you need? Do people need to build their decks more defensively? Are they maybe not putting in a very important, very you know, singular card that you think is overperforming? Um, are they just thinking about the entire archetype incorrectly? What is, what's the spice? I'm sorry to disappoint you, but I don't really have any specific spice. I don't think there's any card that's really overlooked, and I don't think that. There's anything wrong with the strategies people are employing, I guess. 
like like Hayden said several times, old times results over the road to nationals were pretty reasonable. It was just a lack of representation for the most part. And I think if you're playing old time and you have a plan that you can attack people reasonably and you have a plan where you have a good defensive plan, I think you're fine. There's nothing that I think is like a silver bullet that people might be missing. I do like Brothers in Arms. I will say that. Uh, I've been a Brothers in Arms fan so far from from playing in Guardian Dix, but you know. That is in my curl list. <laughs> Blue I'll, Brother I'll in Arms. Some, I'll add some spice. I want to ask one last question, Bryn. I'm going to steal the last question is I want to go around the table. What is winning Utrecht this weekend? We've got the Calling Utrecht coming up. This is going to be our first kind of you know, Road to Nationals, yes, very important data, very good spread of data, but we're going to get a major this weekend. So uh, what's what hero is winning? Uh, Brendan, your prediction, please. I think Viscera will win. All right, Michael, what do you think is going to win this weekend? I'm going to say Lexi. All right. That was, I'm going to go Briar then. I was tossing up between Lexi and Briar. I'll go Briar. There we go. Let's see. Let's see who's right. We'll, pro- we'll all be wrong. It's going to be Ultim. <laughs> and Michael's going to feel bad that he didn't back his boy. So. <laughs> No, no. Michael, I want to say uh, a massive thank you for, for joining us. I do want to give one last uh, opportunity for you to just plug the, the Manor podcast and uh, what you're doing out there before we, before we say goodbye to you. Where can, we, uh, where can we find you if we're looking for the Roger and Michael show? Yeah, so the Manor podcast, it's spelled M-N-R podcast. You can find us on YouTube or any major podcasting platforms. And I also want to say thank you guys for having me on here and chatting with me about the metagame yep we'll see you very soon we'll be seeing you in lil so uh thanks again michael for coming on yep see you there a massive thank you of course to michael for joining us on the pod this week brendan no uh no google review this week but if you do want to get them in rate this podcast.com forward slash arsenal pass uh you know we're, we're starting to get thin on on some of the reviews we've had some some amazing ones so please get your reviews in give brendan a little laugh or you know give us a nice help heartfelt sort of review or maybe some you know some good constructive feedback uh of course it does help us get out there as well all these reviews on different platforms just uh get on those rankings and those charts get out to more fish and blood players so we do appreciate it but brendan that's uh that's what we've got time for this week uh do just quickly want to shout it again to our patrons and to twitter if you want to follow us on twitter brendan is at brendan apg i'm at fian underscore dale Come and jump on the Fab Fitness Challenge chat on Twitter, uh, tw- Twitter, Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> as well as, of course, just general flesh and blood Twitter, which is always popping off. Uh, but until next week, Brendan, see you later. Yeah, see you.